All right. Welcome everyone to Monday lecture. I hope you guys had a great weekend. Um, as we discussed last week, this lecture is going to be a little bit different since it's recorded. Um, I am trying a new technological setup here. Hopefully, you know, I'll double check to make sure that everyone can hear me. Um, I will also be using annotations on Zoom. I hope everybody can see these and I'm hopeful that um, these will help you guys as we go through the lecture. Um, so this is me writing it out. I have a little iPad set up. It's a little delayed. So, you know, we'll see how well it works. And if it works well, I might actually try doing this um, during lecture on Wednesday, sort of live in person, just to help support some of our Zoom friends that join um, that can't make it you know, uh, to our lecture in person. So anyway, getting started, uh, homework seven. Homework seven is due this Wednesday at 11.59 p.m. So I really want you guys to make sure you submit that on time. Um, the auto grader is up and uh, available. There's a C++ version. There is a Python version. So you can do whichever one uh, you prefer. And please go ahead and submit that. It's covering a lot of really critical stuff related to graphs, which is the, you know, we've been spending sort of several weeks at this point learning about graphs. So please, please make sure that you do this homework. Cool. Moving on, there's also a Hack MCAT 5.0, the remix. So if you guys are willing to go to this hackathon, or if you do go to this hackathon in McNair on April 1st, um, 4 p.m. to midnight, and then day two is actually going to be virtual, Keep that in mind. If you attend either of these days, either of these days, I will give you um, bonus points in the class. So please go ahead, please attend. Uh, that would make a big, you know, big difference for the school. And I think it's going to be really, you know, really great to go there. Google is going to be there. Amazon's going to be there. Salesforce, uh, AM is going to be there. Honeywell, just a lot of really great companies. You know, please scan this QR code. Go ahead and register. All right. So moving on. Let's go ahead and get started with lecture. Welcome to Comp 285. This is where we really uh, get down to things. We're gonna be doing more dynamic programming. Okay, more dynamic programming. We're gonna do this for the next two lectures. We're just gonna cover different examples of dynamic programming so that you guys get familiar with it and you know what the recipe looks like. All right, so last time we were covering something called the longest common subsequence, right? Longest, so that you know this is an optimization problem because we're doing something having to do with maximizing the length of something. And then we talked about subsequence. So if you guys remember a subsequence here is just a sequence of letters in the same order. So this uh, A is coming from this A, right? G is coming from this G, C, C is coming from C, C. And then you notice T here, we actually skip one of the C's and we go to T, right? So that's why this is a subsequence, okay? Now, the sequence itself is always a subsequence, right? But what we're gonna try to do is we're gonna try to find a subsequence of two strings. So here you notice on this side, we actually skip this first G, and then we start with A, we skip this C, we skip this A, then we go to G, so that's A, G, C, C, T, A, you know, and so on and so forth. So you'll notice that we're actually skipping some of the letters, um, same way we skip some of the letters here. And our goal is given two strings. So we're gonna call this string X and this string Y. Given two strings, um, what is the longest common subsequence of the two, All right? And you can imagine this is really helpful actually here um, for comparing DNA between two, two species, right? If the subsequence is very long, then that means the two species are probably related. Great. So again, like I mentioned, subsequence. So again, for example, here, B, D, F, H is a subsequence of A, B, C, D, E, F, I, because you have B here, you have D here, F, and then H. Uh, if X and Y are sequences, a common subsequence is sequence, which is a subsequence of both, right? So again, um, here's an example, B, D, F, H is a common subsequence of both A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, and A, B, C, D, F, G, H, I. All right, so here you have B, D, F, H. So that is this subsequence. And here you have B, D, F, H. That is also um, a subsequence. So we say this subsequence is common between this B and X and this B and Y. 
Now, the longest common subsequence is out of all the possible common subsequences, what's the longest? So again, in this case, the longest common subsequence is actually uh, A, B, D, F, G, H, as we have here. Um, and you can notice that like, you know, A, B, D is also a subsequence, but it's not the longest, right? The longest we can possibly get is A, B, D, F, G, H, where we take A, B from here, A, B from here. And you can imagine this has to be the longest because this part for the Y input here, this is already A, B, D, F, G, H, I, A, A, A D, H. The only option to make it longer is, well, let's include I, but it's actually impossible to include I because this sequence does not have I in it, okay? So we sometimes want to, like I mentioned, there's a lot of applications, um, bioinformatics, the Unix diff tool, merging and version control. This actually comes up all the time in like real world applications. It's essentially anytime you try, want to try to find the difference between two strings, you could imagine using this algorithm. So uh, it turns out that to solve this problem, you can actually use dynamic programming. So that's great. Let's try that. Step one, we want to identify the optimal substructure. Step two, we want to find a recursive formulation. So we want to figure out how do we solve this problem given the answers to smaller problems. Then we use dynamic programming to actually solve the problem. If needed, um, for example, we're going to find out that solving the problem for having the longest common subsequence, it's actually helpful to actually find the length of the longest common subsequence. But our actual problem is to find the actual longest common subsequence. So we're going to talk about examples of where we can, uh, apologies for the background noise, by the way, where we can use um, what additional information we need to add to our algorithm in order to actually return the longest common subsequence. And then we're going to code it up like a reasonable person Step four and step five, we're not going to focus too much in this class. This class is really focused primarily on these, step one through step three. Um, but your homework, you will get to practice step four through step five. Great. Uh, so like I mentioned, um, let's talk about identifying optimal substructure. So as I was alluding to before, we have two strings. Um, we're going to label them x and y, OK, x and y. And what we're going to do is we're going to denote the prefix of a particular string by the subscript. So for example, this string here, ACG, this is going to be called Y4, right? That's this string here. Um, this string, for example, AC, we're going to call this Y sub 2, OK? So we're just introducing notations that we can easily reference any substring of our strings, right? And we're going to be, we're actually going to be referencing the prefixes. These are called prefixes because essentially, you know, if you have y i, this means take y from zero and include everything up to the ith character. That's what that means. Okay. And then our sub problem is going to be um, c i j. Let me switch back to my red color. Um, Cij is going to be the length. Like I mentioned, we're going to first solve the length of the longest common subsequence of x, i, and y, j. OK, so now we're actually creating a bunch of problems, right? So C, um, C, N, N, the, uh, C, N, M, right? This is the answer to the longest common subsequence of x, n, and x, n, y, m, which really is the answer to our original problem, right? Because x, n is this whole thing, and y, m is this whole thing, right? Now, what we just did here is we defined a bunch of other smaller problems, OK? So now we actually have, for example, c, uh, we're actually not going to start with 0. So let me undo a little bit of this, c. 1, 1 is actually going to say, what is the longest common subsequence of x1 and y1? And again, x1 is just the letter A. y1 is just the letter A. So actually, the answer here is just 1, right? Because the longest common subsequence between these two is just A, which has length 1, right? 
And then you can imagine you also have, you know, now you have another problem too. You have, you have C2, 2, right? You have C1, 2. You have all these problems. And what we're going to do is we're going to slowly build them up going this way. Because what we're going to talk about now is the fact that we can solve bigger problems. Like we can solve C2, 2 if we know the answer to C11, C12, et cetera. Okay. So let's try that, um, which is this part. Okay. So the goal is to write CIJ, right? So now we're talking about general CIJ. So CIJ is going to be the longest common subsequence between XI and YJ. Okay. So again, there could be more stuff here. There could be a lot more letters, right? Like T, W, X, right? There could be a lot more letters here, blah, 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 blah. But right now, we're going to focus on just solving this problem, but we're looking at these two subsequences um, to find index parameterized by I and J. Okay. And the way we're going to do this is we can think about there's really two cases. We're going to look at the very last letter, um, at the ith letter and the jth letter. Okay. And looking at the very last letter, there's two cases. Okay. Either the ith letter of x and the ith letter of y match up. So that's this first case, okay? So if that's the case, then the length of the longest common subsequence is actually going to be, like you know these match. So the longest common subsequence is gonna be one plus one because these a's match. So we know it's at least length one plus whatever the length between this and this, what is the longest common subsequence between these two? So we're gonna say C I minus one, J minus one, right? Because we know the A's we can take, right? Because the A's match up. So we know for sure our longest common subsequence is gonna be at least one plus, and then whatever is the longest between this one and this one, which is given by this value, okay? And that's exactly what we have here. If you notice, that's exactly what we came up with. Um, because the longest common subsequence of you know, xi, yj is whatever the longest common subsequence is of xi minus one, yj minus one, followed by a. Cool. The other case is they don't match, right? So we have, uh, we have a T and an A, for example, these letters don't match. So we're looking at just the last letter. We're looking at XI, the Ith letter, and the Jth letter of Y. Okay, if they don't match, then there's a couple of options, basically. Um, the, we definitely can't take these two letters, right? So now the longest common subsequence, it's either gonna be XI, this whole thing, and this part, you know, how do we make the problem smaller? So it's going to be xi and yj minus one, or there's another option. It could be yj, this whole thing, and xi minus one. Those are the two options as to like what the longest common subsequence could be, the length of the longest common subsequence, right? So if they don't match, then you might not take t, right? in which case it's the length of xi minus one and j, or you don't take a, in which case it's the length of j, uh, y, j minus one and i, xi, okay? And that's actually exactly what we have here. So because we have two options, we actually end up taking the max of the two because we're trying to find the longest common subsequence. So we say, well, the longest common subsequence from i to j of xi and xj, if the letters don't match, is basically going to be either the longest common subsequence from i minus one to j, or the longest common subsequence from i and j minus one, right? It's going to be one of these two, and whichever one is bigger, that's going to be our answer. So that's why we take this max here. Okay. Right. So these are our two subcases. T is not involved, A is not involved. So again, so that actually gives us a recursive uh, formulation for our optimal solution. So we can recursively define our answer. And this is just what we covered before. We said CIJ is either if the two characters are equal to each other, 
it's equal to this. We have one plus the two shorter strings, right? If they're not equal to each other, then it's going to be the maximum of these two values. Okay. And then we also have our base cases, which we didn't really talk about, but you know, if I is zero or J is zero, which means one of our strings is, is the empty string, then the longest common subsequence is obviously zero. Okay. So this is the two examples we just covered. Okay, so now we're gonna use dynamic programming to actually find it. And here's what the code would look like for dynamic programming. And you can imagine that you're really just taking, again, like you wrote this out mathematically, and then to write the code, you're just writing it directly, right? So for our base cases, you know, when I equals zero or J equals zero, we do this. We simply initialize, you know, we have this C matrix is gonna be a, you know, this C vector is gonna be a big fat matrix like this. And it's going to be of um, of height uh, height m and with j just because j is going off up to n and i is going up to m. And the very first thing we're going to do is we're going to fill in zeros here, right? That's what this line is doing. That's just a bunch of zeros in our matrix. That's the very first thing. And what is that saying? That's saying, well, the length of the longest common subsequence between x i and y0, which is the empty string, is empty. You know, c0 and j, it's empty, OK? So um, then what we do is we actually iterate. We have two for loops from i equals 1 to m and j equals 1 to n. You're going to slowly iterate and fill in this column. So again, we're going to start at i1, j1. So we're actually going to start with this cell, right? And what you'll notice is that the cells to the right and up, sorry, to the left and up are already filled in. And those are the only cells we depend on because we say, well, if x i equals y j, so if we look at our input and the i character is equal to the j character, then this cell 1 1 is going to be equal to i minus 1 j minus 1. So it's going to be equal to going up diagonally this 0 plus 1. And we'll put in 1 there, right? Otherwise, if they don't match, we're going to do this max. So we're going to we're going to look to the left. We're going to look at this one. Or we're going to look at this one to the right. And we're going to take the maximum of those two. And then we're going to continue. We're going to fill in this whole row, then this row, then this row, and so on. It's here. Cool. And so hopefully you guys had a chance to think about that. And I'm going to go ahead and continue. Uh, so one thing to notice as well here is that the running time of this algorithm is nm, right? So we have two for loops, four from i to m. And then these are actually two nested for loops. Another way to think about it is that we have a big matrix, right? Like I mentioned before. And we're going to fill it all in, right? So at minimum, we need to do nm work. So we have to fill in the whole matrix. And the matrix is of size n times m. And then what we notice is that to fill in each entry here, we're either adding one to an entry that already exists, or we are taking the maximum of two previous entries. Both of these operations are constant work, right? They're just one, two, three, four steps. So the total running time is nm. OK, so let's walk through an example just to see. So again, here's ACGGA and ACTG, right? So here's our y. Here's our x. Here's the matrix C that we're going to try to fill in. And we're just going to get started, right? So the very first thing we're going to do is we're going to try to fill in this corner, right? So what that means is we're going to look at x, you know, at the first letter and at the first letter. If they match, right? If you remember, if they match, so that's hitting this case, then the value is going to be 1 plus we're going to go up diagonally. We're going to look this way. So the value here is going to be one. Okay. Then we're going to keep going. We're going to go to the next one. So now we're going to look here. I'm going to say, well, we're going to try to fill this value in. So the way we fill it in is, maybe I should switch colors. So we're going to try to fill in this value. We're going to look at the C here, and we're going to look at the A here. So we're looking at the first letter and at the second letter of Y, right? And they don't match, OK? So if they don't match, we're actually hitting this second case right here, 
Um, so that means that we're actually going to look up. We're going to look at this value here, and then we're going to go look left at this value, and we're going to take the bigger of the two. So in this case, we're going to take one, right? Because that's the bigger of the two. Does that make sense to everyone? And you can see how like we're not actually doing that much work because we're just looking at we're taking the maximum values we've already computed. Right. So when we move over to the next one. So now we're going to be looking at this value here at t, and we're going to be looking at a again. Right. So this whole row we're always looking at a, and we're just moving now. We're looking at t. So what we're saying is like what is the longest common subsequence between a and a c t? Right. That's what this is trying to answer. And the answer is well the a and the t don't match. So it's going to be the longest common subsequence between A and AC, or the longest common subsequence between ACT and the empty string. So that's why we, so this zero is the longest common subsequence between ACT and the empty string. This one is the longest common subsequence between AC and A. And because these letters don't match, right, the T does not match the A, then the answer has to be one of these two. And we take the bigger one, right? So the answer there is going to be one again. And we move on to the next one. What's the answer going to be? You guys should pause the video and think about it. But the answer is going to be one again, because again, the A and the G don't match, right? So now we move on to the next row, right? So you can imagine we just finished one iteration of the loop going this way. So now we come back and we look at this value. And now we're looking at AC. So now let's switch colors. You know, we're going to be looking at this subsequence AC. And we're going to compare it to each of the subsequent, each of the prefixes of y. So we're going to look at the prefix ac, and we're going to compare it to each of the prefixes of y. So the first prefix, prefix is a. Um, so we're going to be looking, but the thing is, we look at a here, and then we look at c here, right? And we, what we're trying to answer is what the what's the longest common subsequence of ac and a. That's what's going to go into this box, right? And the way to answer that, that's the thing we just noticed, is well, it's either the longest common subsequence of AC and empty, right? So that, that's this zero. Or it's the longest common subsequence of A and A, which is this one, which we filled in earlier. So this is once again going to be one. Okay. But now we get to, you know, so all of these cases were actually the one where we just took the maximum of the left and the top, right? All of these cases. Uh, but now we're actually coming back to the place where we're going to look at the diagonal and we're going to add one, fine? Because now we're going to be asking for AC here and AC here. And that's what this number is going to be. And you'll notice that the C, we're actually just going to look at this C and we're going to look at this C. They actually match. So that means the longest common subsequence is falling in this case, which is it's going to be one because these match plus the longest common subsequence of A and A. But we don't actually need to do any work for these because we already have the answer right here. So this is just one plus this. So that is going to be two. Okay. And so on. So for the next one, we're going to look at, uh, let me clear the board a little bit so we get some more room. So the next one, we're going to look at C and we're going to look at T. They don't match. So we're going to take the max of two and one, right? So it's two. And again, what is that saying? That's saying that the longest common subsequence between AC and ACT is actually two AC. Okay. And then we do the same thing again. So now we actually we look at C and G. And again, they don't match. So we're going to take the max of two and one because they don't match. So that's going to be two. Then we're going to come down here. And now we're going to look at G. So actually, let's clear this. Let's clear again to make it clear. We're going to look at G first. And then we're going to look at A. Okay. And these don't match. So again, they don't match. So we're going to take the max of 0 and 1. Right? And then what is that answering? That is telling you. So this one, right? This one is telling you that the longest common subsequence between A, C, G and A is of length 1, which is actually just A. And why? That's because the longest common subsequence between A, C, G and A is actually the same as the longest common sequence between AC and A. So it, it, we grab this one. And this one actually also came from the longest common subsequence being between A and A, which was this one, right? And this one came from the base case here where we took this 0 plus 1. So you can see 0 plus 1, 1, 1, 1. So it just went down, right? 
So let me clear that up and let's keep going. So now we look at G and we look at C, they don't match. So we take the max of the left and max of the top. So this is gonna be two, right? Then we look again at G and at T and they don't match. So we're gonna take the max of two and two. That's gonna be two. Then we look at G and at G, they do match. So now we're actually going to look diagonally at this answer and we're gonna add one to it and that's gonna give us three, okay? Then we repeat, you know, we go back to the next row. We look at G, they don't match. So G and A don't match. That's just, we're gonna take the max of this and this. Uh, then we look at G and C, they don't match. So we're gonna take the max of this and this that actually gives us two. Then the G and the T don't match. So we're gonna take again, the max of these two, that's gonna give us two. And then the G and the G do match. So we're actually gonna look diagonally and we're gonna add one. So that's gonna give us three, right? And then we go to the last row, we start with A. So we look at A and A, they do match. So we're going to look diagonally and add one. Then we look at A here and C here, they don't match. So we just take the max of these two, that's going to give us two. A and T don't match. So we take the max of these two, that's going to give us two. And then A and G don't match. So we take the max of these two and that's going to give us three. And it turns out our answer is three because three is the longest common subsequence of ACG, ACTG, so all of Y and all of X, which is what we wanted, right? But again, to, to get this answer, we have to fill in row by row, okay? Let's clear that up, hopefully that makes sense. So now we actually go to the last step of this, which is find the actual longest common subsequence. And the way to do this, as you can imagine, you know, this is our table. This is what we just filled in last time. But you can imagine, you know, like if you want to figure out what is the actual sequence, then you kind of start, you know, you know, you want to start at the very bottom left corner because that is where N and M, right? So you want to look at this corner. And basically the question you want to answer is, did I go up or left or did I go, um, did I go diagonally, right? And the idea here is you start with three, all right? And what you do is you look at the two letters that correspond to this three. So they, the, the way we got this three was by looking at G and at A. And we saw that they didn't match, right? So because they didn't match, that means this number either came from the two or from the three. And obviously it came from the bigger one. So it came from the three. So we go up, okay? And then we repeat the process. Now we look at this G and this G and they do match, which means this three actually did not come from this three above. It actually came from the two diagonally. And not only that, but we have just found the last letter of our common subsequence, this G, right? So we can write that G down and say, well, this is the last letter of our least com longest common subsequence. And we look up diagonally, right? So now that we go diagonally, we look at G and T, and we notice, well, it had to come from one of these, from either two or two. Um, it doesn't matter which one it came from. It actually doesn't matter which direction you go because they're the same. Um, but in this case, we're just going to go up, right? So we won't go sideways. So we'll just go up. And the two may as well have come from this other two, right? And then the thing here is now we're looking at C and T. So again, they don't match. So the question is, did this two come from the one or from the two? Well, it had to come from this two. So we have to go horizontally. Right. Then we have C and C, which means they do match. So first of all, that gives you, you know, now you have you had G from before that now gives you C because they did match. So that's your other letter. And not only that, but it tells you that you must have come diagonally. Right. So you have to go up to the one one. And then similarly here, you notice that the A's match. So that gives you your other letter A. And you know that you must have come diagonally. You get to the end. So now you got to zero zero. Right. So basically you start at NM or whatever this bottom left corner is, bottom right corner is, and you try to move your way up based on which way, you, where your numbers came from. Okay. And that's how you can reconstruct, you know, so with this algorithm, you can reconstruct the actual least common subsequence, even though your original algorithm only found the length. Um, so this is it's a good exercise. I encourage you guys to write out the pseudocode for what we just saw. Okay. You can also find it in the lecture notes. So the lecture notes on the comp 285 website 
have the pseudocode for this. Okay, I encourage you guys to try to implement this. I'll probably ask you to do it in the homework. So please, please implement it. It takes nm time to fill in the table and it takes nm plus m time to recover the actual LCS, right? Um, All together, we can find the LCS in O, M, N time. Okay, so then this is actually pretty fast. So that is our recipe for dynamic programming. That's yet another example that you have covered. So what you would do next is you would code this up like a reasonable person, right? Because now you have the pseudocode, now you know how it works. So now you would actually sit down and try to code it. Um, and then just do it reasonably, right? So you don't want to like create a million arrays, right? You want to reuse your answers, et cetera. So again, like we're not going to cover, we're going to do this in the homework, I'll say. So I'm actually going to ask you guys to just do this in the homework. Um, so you're going to have a lot of fun in the homework, but I want you to have good practice. Okay. So again, our approach actually isn't too bad. Okay. If we're only interested in the length of the longest common subsequence, we can do a bit better on space, actually. So if we only want the length, we don't want the actual uh, longest common subsequence. You, if you notice, when we fill in the table, we do one row at a time. So that means if we only want the length, right? if we're not interested in reconstructing the whole sequence, then we can actually just keep track of the single row. Um, if we want to recover the actual longest common sequence, then we need the whole table. And the question I would ask you guys is, can you do better? You know, can we do better than the O, M, N time? The answer is yes, we can do a bit better um, by a factor of log. So we can actually do big O of M, N over log to the 1,000 N, I think, or something like that. Um, but doing much better is actually an open question. So we have no idea if we can actually do much better than this algorithm that was just presented for this problem. So what, he, what have we learned? We've, we've learned we can find the least common subsequence in nm time if the length of y is n and the length of x is m. We went through the steps to come up with a dynamic programming algorithm. Okay, So you guys should be familiar with that recipe that I presented to you, which is we kept a two-dimensional table broke down the problem, okay? All right, so now let's move on to another problem. We're gonna introduce the knapsack problem. So it's another good dynamic programming problem. Well, the way this works is we have N items that have weights and values, right? So this is like, you're, try you're trying to fill in a backpack, okay, with a turtle, and it has two things. It has a weight and it has a value. Let's say like how much it costs or like how valuable it is to you, right? Some number. Okay, you have a light bulb, you know, slightly less heavy than the turtle. You have a watermelon, you have a taco. Um, and then you have, for example, a fire truck, right? And the thing to notice, each of these have a weight and they also have a value. And then what you have is you also have a backpack. Okay, and that's the setup for the problem. Okay, and the question is that the backpack can only carry so much weight. Right. You can't carry everything. You can only carry, let's say, 10 pounds. Right. So let's say each of these are in pounds. Right. So you can only carry 10 pounds. Then the question is, which items do I carry to maximize my value? Right. So which are the items? You know, obviously I can carry, you know, um, you know, I could carry three tacos and that gives me thirty nine dollars of value, let's say. Right. But is that the most value I can do? Like, what if instead I do two watermelons, right? So that gives me 28 of value. And then, or actually, yeah, what if I do one watermelon and one turtle? So that actually gives me, oh, that's 34 of value. So yeah, so maybe the three tacos is the best. I don't know, but that's the question, right? The question is, how do you figure that out, okay? And that's the problem that we're actually going to try to solve. Um, so there are actually two versions of this problem. The first is called the unbounded knapsack. So this one is, suppose you have an infinite number of copies of each item. So you can take as many turtles as you want. Okay. You can take as many light bulbs as you want. Okay. You can take as many watermelons as you like. Okay. Uh, there is like an infinite amount of them, right? Uh, in this case, it looks like actually the most valuable, 
right? It turns out I did work this out because you can take two tacos. That gives you 26 of value, but it costs you six space. And then you can take two light bulbs, which gives you 16 of value because they're each worth eight and it takes up four space. So you fill up your backpack all the way up to 10 and you get $42 worth of value. The other version of this problem is called a zero one knapsack. And we're actually gonna cover both of them. Um, though we'll, we'll, it looks like we're probably gonna have to continue the second one during um, lecture on Wednesday. But the second one's a zero one knapsack. And what this says is you can only take one copy. So once you took one taco, you have no more tacos. Like you only have one taco to take, All right? So the question is the same, which is what's the most valuable way to fill the knapsack? But the answer obviously will be different because in this case, it's actually you take one light bulb, one watermelon, one taco. And that's the most valuable weight. This, the weight is nine because the taco is weight three, watermelon is weight four, and then light bulb is weight two. And the total value is actually 35, right? So first we're gonna cover the first version of this. And I encourage you to pause the video and maybe think about, you know, how might you try to approach this problem? Again, remember we're trying to use dynamic programming. so. Um, the very first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce some notation. So again, like these were specific examples, but when you're trying to write an algorithm, you need to abstract it away, right? So what we're going to say is we're going to have W's, which are going to be the weights. W1 is going to be the weight of item one. W2 is going to be the weight of item two and so on. And we're also going to have V's. V1 is going to be the value of item one. V2 is going to be the value of item two and so on. And then we're going to have a big fat W that has no index, and that's going to be our capacity. That's going to be the total weight that we can carry. Okay. So jumping back, um, I told you this is a dynamic programming problem. So the very first thing you're going to do is you're going to try to apply our recipe for dynamic programming. Okay. Which means first find the optimal substructure. So again, the problem is given a set of weights, given a set of items and a backpack with a certain capacity where you can take as many items as you want, find the maximum value you can get from these items by putting them into the backpack, okay? And uh, here's what I'll give you, which is the optimal sub substructure. This is the hard part. Again, I've told you guys, dynamic programming is hard. This is the part where you have to try just a lot of different things and see what works. But for this problem, what actually works for the unbounded knapsack is the sub problem is, well, look at a smaller backpack, <laughs> right? So if your backpack can fit 10 things, it actually helps you to understand what is the maximum value you can get by fitting nine things. Like not, sorry, not nine things, by fitting, uh, by holding at most nine pounds, okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to define this kx. So again, this is going to be an array, k. And what it's going to say is it's going to have values here, right? So let's say this is one, two, three, right? So it has index s. So kx, right? So this is going to be x, k, k. This is index x, and then there's going to be a value in here, which is going to correspond to kx, right? And kx is going to answer, what is the maximum value I can get if I have a backpack that can only fit x pounds, okay? So this is gonna say kx is gonna be the value you can fit if you can only fit x pounds in your backpack, okay? That's our sub problem. And we're gonna solve all of them, okay? And the answer we're looking for is we're looking for kw, right? Because that's gonna be, so our array is gonna be of length w because this kw is gonna be the answer to, right? the value you can fit in a knapsack of capacity W, which is our original knapsack. Our original backpack had weight, had capacity, big fat W, right? And what I'm saying is our smaller problems, our sub substructure, our sub problems are actually gonna be, well, instead of only looking at capacity W, look at smaller capacities. So like I said, we first solve problems for small knapsacks, then we use those small knapsacks to solve the bigger knapsacks. One way to think about this intuitively is that if you have the smaller knapsacks, you can kind of forget about the items because once you know what's the maximum that can fit into this knapsack, right? You can ask, well, 
how many of these can I fit into this, right? And then once you know what's the maximum that fits into these bigger knapsacks, you could say, well, how many of these can I fit in here? How many of these can I fit in here, All right? So that's how you're using the answers to the smaller problems to help you figure out the bigger problems. Because once you put the items inside, you know, you don't care that this has a turtle or a light bulb, right, or whatever. Now you know that for this knapsack, let's say, you know, let's say this is size 10, let's say this is size five, you know the maximum value here is 30, the maximum value here is, let's say, 50. Let's say this knapsack is of size 15, right? Then obviously you can fit one of these and one of these into it. So the, and that's going to be optimal, right? That's the most you're going to get because this is optimal. This is the most you can get from 10 pounds. This is the most you can get from five pounds. So for 15 pounds, the most you can possibly get is 50 plus 30, which is 80, right? And that's the idea. Okay. Um, so again, say that the optimal solution contains at least one copy of item I, okay? Then this is the optimal for capacity X minus Y I, okay? So this is actually how we're gonna look at it, okay? So let's say we're looking at some backpack with you know, capacity X, right? has value V. Let's say this backpack is optimal. This is already, this is the best we can do. There's no way. Let's say we have that. We have the best we can do, okay? So if that solution, if in here, right, we have a turtle, right? Then taking away the turtle, right, gives us the optimal solution for a backpack with capacity X minus the weight of one turtle, okay? So again, if we take away this turtle, then this is, this is actually the optimal for this smaller backpack. Does that make sense to everyone? This is why this substructure is optimal because once we have, or like why this substructure works for this problem is because there is no way you can improve this. If you know this is the best, right? If this is the best, right? You know this is the best for, cap for capacity X, right? This is the best you can do. Then the best you can do for capacity X minus YI, right? So let's say you don't have enough space to fit one more turtle is you take away the turtle. That's the best you can do. There's no gonna be like, oh, actually, you know, let's replace this, you know, let's replace this light bulb with uh, another fire truck, right? And that's actually, you know, that's actually going to be better. That can't be true because if that was true, then here you could also replace this light bulb with another fire truck. And then that would be better, right? So yeah, you guys should you know think about that for about a minute, make sure you understand where that's coming from. Cause again, this is the hard part. Like if I tell you, you're gonna be like, okay, sure, that makes sense. But the idea is you don't know this when you're given the problems, you have to figure it out on your own. Okay. And that's basically what we covered. If you could do better than the second solution, then adding a turtle to that improvement would improve the first solution, right? So now we have the optimal substructure. So now we jump to step two which is find the recursive formulation of the optimal solution. So how do we use the smaller problems to solve the bigger problem, right? And here is what this looks like, okay? So let Kx be the optimal value capacity. Again, so Kx is the optimal value for a backpack that can fit us at most x pounds, okay? Then Kx is basically the max of, you know, let's consider all possible items that we can remove. So all items whose weight is less than X, right? So that means we can take them out of the backpack, okay? Because the weight is less than X. I mean, they might be in the backpack. So for all items whose weight is less than X, you know, figure out a way to fill in the smaller backpack. So that's this part, KX minus YI. So take that item out and tell me, what is the best way for me to fill that smaller backpack? And then add the value of the i item, right? Because what we know is that for the x backpack, for one with capacity x, its optimal is 
what is the optimal for a backpack with capacity X minus the weight of the ith item? And then I can add the turtle into it. So adding the turtle is going to increase my value by VI, and it's still going to fit, right? Because it has exactly enough space to fit the turtle. Okay. And then the other thing we notice is that the maximum, you know, the maximum capacity, uh, Kx is zero if the, if the maximum is empty. And then there is no I such that Wi is less than or equal to X, right? So if we can't, if there's no item that fits into the backpack, then Kx is zero, right? Whatever this X is. If it's too small, then it's zero. Okay. So moving on, we have um, we have identified the requested formulations. So now we code it up. We just use dynamic programming now because we have the answer, right? This is what we have found out is the recursive solution to this problem. So here's what the algorithm looks like. Very straightforward. We're going to be given W, which is the capacity. We're going to be given N, which is how many items we have. We're going to be given a set of weights and we're going to be given a set of values, right? So there's N weights and N values. And what we do is, well, obviously, k0 equals 0. So if your backpack cannot fit anything, then you can have no value. Okay. Otherwise, starting with capacity 1 up to capacity w, we set kx equal to 0 to start with. And then for each item, we first see, OK, if you can fit into the backpack, then the total value, the optimal value at this capacity is either the optimal value at this capacity or the optimal value at a capacity that was slightly smaller plus the value of the i item. And then at the end, we return kw. Okay, so that's this. This is what we're talking about. It's the max of this for all i. Right? So what this is doing is this, right? So kx started zero. So this is going to be zero the first time. So the very first time, kx is going to be set to this value, right? And then on the next iteration of the while loop, I'm basically taking the max over all i. That's what I'm doing here, OK? Just iterating through it over all i, where the item fits in the backpack. That's it. I'm taking the maximum over all i, where the item fits in the backpack. Okay. Um, so you should be able to immediately see that the running time for this algorithm is nw. Uh, and that's because we iterate w times over n elements. So n w and taking the maximum is a constant. Taking the maximum, adding, indexing, all of this is constant work. O of one. Cool. Question then you should ask yourselves, can you do better? The answer here is that writing down w actually takes log w bits. Writing down all the n weights can take n log w bits. So the input size is actually n log w. So maybe you could have an algorithm that runs in time n log w. So that this is this would be linear. This algorithm here, if you had this algorithm, this we would consider linear in size of input. Okay. So obviously this algorithm we have here. It's not obvious that this is the best possible because an algorithm that runs in this time is one that only looks at the input one time, right? So you could, in theory, have an algorithm that's this fast. This is the algorithm we just discovered, right? So it turns out that this is actually an open problem. No one has found an algorithm better than this, OK? And this is not linear on the size of the input, OK? This is actually off by a factor of w. Linear in the size of the input would be this, OK? So we don't know whether it's possible to be faster. Um, it's, it's open. It's an open research problem. We have no idea if there's a better algorithm. There could be. Um, we think the answer is no. Because if it is true that you can find a better algorithm, then you basically broke the entire world. So we are pretty sure the answer is no. We just haven't proved it. Okay. Step four um, is maybe you need to keep track of some extra information. So for example, here, if we actually wanted to know which are the items that we put into the backpack, right? 
then maybe we'll add sort of this array of items. And then when we change it, you know, then we like take the previous array of items and we say, well, I'll add, you know, item I to it or something. So you might imagine modifying this algorithm so that you can actually keep track of which items you added instead of just knowing what's the maximum value. You can actually be like here, you know, you need three turtles and two light bulbs or something. All right. So in the last couple of minutes in class, let's actually just go through an example. So again, this is your pseudocode here. Okay, it should be pretty easy to implement. Actually, it's just a couple of for loops and a couple of arrays. But then what you do is, again, like we mentioned, we start with, um, you know, k0, we set it equal to 0. And then what we're going to do is we're going to try to fill in k1, right? Because that's what this for, first for loop does. What it's going to do is it's, it's first going to set, set k1 to 0. And then it's going to say, OK, for each item that I have, Right, so let's say these are my three items here. For each item, do any of these fit into the backpack? The answer is only the turtle, right? So if the turtle fits, so that's hitting this if statement, then kx is going to be the max of zero in how many, how many items, what's the maximum value I can get from one minus one, right? So this is saying my backpack can fit one, but I'm going to take one of the turtles. So now he can only fit zero. What's the maximum value I can get from a backpack that can fit zero? So that's actually going to be zero plus the value of the turtle I just took. So that's going to be one. This is the only one here. So this is actually one because we can only fit the turtle, right? And then, but now we move on to two. So we say, are there any items we can fit? Well, you'll notice now that we clear this up for the two, Obviously, you can fit a turtle, right? Because it has weight one. And that gives you, um, you know, that'll be how much can I fit? What is k of one plus the value of the turtle, which is one? And k of one here, we actually already have the answer. It's one, right? And you don't actually know that you have another turtle here, but you know that the most you can possibly fit in a backpack of size one is something that gives you a value one. And then you could also fit another turtle because now your backpack is of size two. That's one plus one. The other option is you can fit a light bulb, right? Because its weight is two. So that gives you value four plus K zero. Because now you have to figure out, well, if I fit the light bulb, I, only, I have zero space left over. So what is the maximum I could possibly fit in zero space? So that gives you zero. So that's zero plus four and one plus one. And then you take the bigger of the two. So it actually gives you two. So you could fit two turtles, right? But it turns out the best is to fit one light bulb. Okay. Then we move on to three, right? So now you're trying to fill in the third one. And you say, well, what can I fit in there? And there's a lot of options, right? You could fit one turtle plus, right, so you could do one turtle, which has value one, plus k of two, which is what's the maximum I can fit into a backpack that has size two. And actually, the answer to that is four. So if you fit a turtle, one more turtle, your total value is five, right? The other option is, well, maybe I can fit a light, right? So that'll be plus two, and then what is the maximum I could fit into a backpack of size one, right? Because now you lost two of your space. So maximum you can fit into a backpack of size one is this. So this is one plus two. So if you take the light bulb, your value is three. If you take a, a turtle, your value is five. Now the question is, well, what if I take just the watermelon? So the watermelon is gonna be plus three, uh, plus six, because its value is six, right? And then it's going to say, well, how many things can I fit into a backpack of size zero? Because I just took the watermelon, right? This is zero. So it actually gives you six. So you'll notice first you try a turtle and a light bulb. That gives you five. Then you try. Uh, but at the end of the day, the thing that's going to fit the most is going to be the watermelon. So you're going to take the six, OK? And then you repeat. We do it one more time. Right? So now we start at capacity four. And the thing to notice is like for each capacity, you're able to use the answers to the previous capacities, right? 
So for capacity four here, um, the first thing you'll try is, well, you see, well, maybe I can take another turtle. So you'll say, well, the value of the turtle is one. So that's going to give me one value. Plus, how many things can I optimally fit in something of size three? And the answer is six. So that's going to be six plus one for the turtle, right? The other option is, well, maybe I can take a light bulb. So that's going to give you plus four because the light bulb has value four, but it's going to take away two from your capacity. So you say, well, what's the maximum I can fit in a backpack of size two? You have the answer to that. It's actually four. Turns out it's another, it's another light bulb, but you know, so this will be four plus four. So this already gives you eight, this gives you seven. The other option is maybe you take a watermelon. So if you take a watermelon, that gives you plus six value. But now you have to remove three of the weight. So you go all the way back to K1, right? And that K1, you actually already know the answer, it's one. So also this gives you seven. So these two give you seven, this gives you eight. So you actually take this one, which is eight. So you take the light bulb. Um, and that is going to conclude for today. So again, I hope you guys enjoyed walking through those two dynamic programming problems. We are going to continue doing this on Wednesday um, because the last step here is just to code it up like a reasonable person. And we're actually going to pass, you know, we're going to take a pass on that. Um, all right, so I'm going to stop the lecture there and I'll see you guys on Wednesday.